be prepared in a world of increasing challenge and division so that libraries can continue to hold their place as defenders of the freedom to read with all the benefits that this endows on those with that freedom. The first webinar was an introduction to what was in the toolkit overall with a deep dive into the policies and processes libraries need to have to be prepared. That webinar was recorded uh, and is available through Lianza Connect. This session looks at the legal and ethical frameworks around protecting freedom of information and human rights in Aotearoa. And so we are thrilled today to be joined by some experts in the area. We have Rupert Ablett Hampson from Te Mana Whakatu Classification Office to discuss the role of the office and the process they take when receiving classification requests. And we also have Nicole Brown, who's a lawyer from the Office of Human Rights Proceedings. And Nicole will look at the Bill of Rights and Human Rights Acts and other legislation which impacts on this area. Then my fellow committee member, Marlise Zip van der Laan, will talk about the library professional statements that can guide your policies and practices, including freedom of access to information. There will be time for questions uh, at the end of all the speakers rather than after each one. And we're going to use chat for that. So we'll use the meeting chat. I'll read out the questions and then the, the, the best person will uh, give an answer to that. Uh, as Angela has said, this will be recorded as well so that it can be used as a resource afterwards. So please keep your cameras and microphones off. Uh, that makes it a better recording for us. But now let us put aside our mahi and other life distractions and focus on our kopapa with the help of a karakia. Tutawa mai irunga, tutawa mai iraro. Tutawa mai i roto, tutawa mai i waho. Kia tu ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora ki te katoa. Homie, huie, taikie. The toolkit itself can be found on the Lianza website, or of course by searching the web for Lianza Freedom to Read Toolkit. It is designed to help you with the issues of book challenges and mis- and disinformation. And it helps you prepare for challenges by providing information on the New Zealand context and legislation involved in the area. It helps identify the policies and processes libraries should have. There are printable quick guides for public library managers, collections librarians, Sorry. Sorry. Your slides are going a bit. <laughs> I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> Manic here. Uh, if you could go back. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, there are, I'll just repeat that, but there are printable quick guides for public library managers, collections librarians, school librarians, front of line and call centre staff. There's a link to frequently asked questions and key messages. And there are also some case studies on Māori history, misinformation, and also rain, the rainbow community content. And I just want to uh, talk about that a little bit because we are having quite a lot of um, uh, protests at the moment as libraries have been celebrating Pride and uh, have been having events such as Rainbow Story Times and uh, Rotorua. Uh, in the end uh, cancelled their planned session because of health and safety issues. Uh, Gisborne is uh, going ahead with theirs today, we just heard, uh, but you you would have seen that the Destiny Church has, has got completely up in arms about these and has done things like painting over a rainbow pedestrian crossing um, <laughs> to show their displeasure. So the, in the toolkit, uh, the um, 
both the case study on rainbow will help with this area and also in the processes section there's quite a lot on event planning right next slide thanks Ange. so in our first webinar we talked about what is a challenge and I'll, a challenge can come from anyone members of the public an individual a group or organization as we are seeing at the moment uh, and could be received in person by email phone call or via social media challenges reflect people's beliefs about what they think is right wrong and harmful and these beliefs might be specific to a person's culture religion upbringing or their own ideas what can be fraught is when a person attempts to impose their views on what they think is right, wrong or harmful onto others. They're trying to determine what others can access based on their beliefs. Today, what we're focusing on is the legal and ethical framework that guides our response, which is under this button on our toolkit. Next slide, thank you. Also in our last webinar, we talked about the book Welcome to Sex, which has been challenged in libraries. And as all the libraries who had those challenges decided to retain it, with some suggesting that the, if the complainant was not satis satisfied, they could submit the book to Tamana Fakatu. Someone in that case did. And the answer were invited as an interested party to make a submission to the review. And we argued, of course, that the book should remain unrestricted. The office released their decision in November last year and published the full decision document on their website, which is a really good read because it gives you a really good idea about what are all the things that um, the office might look at. And despite that decision, being so available and in such detail, one of the board members of Family First was interviewed on Reality Check Radio and claimed that the chief censor had not considered the book in depth, depth and should be challenged. So we are very happy today to have Rupert Ablett Hampson from Tamana Fakatu, and I'll hand over to him. Lovely, thank you very much, Louise. Uh, kia ora, I'm Rupert Ablett Hampson uh, from Tamana Fakatu, the classification office. Uh, for the first 20 minutes or so of my presentation, you can watch me wrestle with the technology to try and uh, <laughs> find, um, I think that this is the presentation and hopefully what you're seeing is a, a picture of a, a young person with a um, laptop. Excellent. That's a thumbs up. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so, in essence, what I propose to do today is a bit of a whistle stop tour uh, through how we go about classification. I'm not really addressing substantively uh, the uh, welcome to sex classification. Happy to take questions on that afterwards if you'd like to. Uh, so it'll turn into a bit of a rollicking trip. Um, oh, I just, um, oh yes, sorry, there's me getting confused. So uh, just a little bit of a content warning. Um, I won't be describing any particular um, publications in any detail, um, but the reasons we classify things are for distressing content. So I will reference some of those reasons. And there are a couple of details of publications. It's mature, but I just thought I'd uh, give you that warning. Um, so, in essence, uh, we are an independent Crown entity. We make our decisions at arm's length from government. Uh, our purpose is, is on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. Uh, we inform and empower New Zealanders to experience, understand, create, and share content in a positive way while safeguarding our tamariki and rangatahi from harm. Um, we're a regulator, we provide ratings for entertainment, not broadcast, not stuff that's on the telly. Um, and we also determine whether publications are illegal. I think I've got a little um, uh, laser pointer here, which I'd like to play with, uh, and that's the uh, forensic work there. 
Um, so those, those are referred to as by um, the law enforcement agencies. Um, apart from um, ratings of uh, entertainment, we also have a research and uh, education function. Um, and uh, a lot of that education is based around research that we've done. And often that's about um, harmful uh, content, uh, but which is not within our jurisdiction. Um, in order to really understand what we do, um, we really need to talk about the C word, and the C word is censorship. Um, it's unavoidably censorship of what we do. Uh, as the deputy chief censor, uh, and there is also a chief censor, uh, the, um, the censorship is in the title. Uh, if you talk to North Americans, it freaks them out a little bit that we have a censorship. Um, and that is because of a negative perspective of censorship. Uh, but there are considerable protections in the law that we operate in. We have very strict tests under the law. Uh, I will provide you with some more details than you'll want about that, probably. Um, all of our decisions are recorded in writing with reasons. All of our decisions are entered into a publicly accessible register. And you can look at those yourselves online. Um, all of our decisions are challengeable at a board of review. So the welcome to sex uh, decision was able to be challenged at a board of review. It was not. Um, and uh, we're also open to reviewing past decisions. We acknowledge that times change and um, decisions made previously, they can be resubmitted again and there's provision for that in the law. Um, when I tend to sit down uh, with free speech advocates, there's often little difference between what we actually censor and what they think the limits of free speech are. And I think you'll see why as we go through the law. Um, by taking the line that we do in relation to the application law, we believe that we're actually protecting freedom of expression. Um, which is not only the right to speak, it's also the right to receive that information. Um, you were probably thinking, I was talking about another C word. Uh, the, the other C word is uh, classification. Um, and classification actually is the, uh, is the phrase that's used most often throughout uh, the legislation uh, to define the task that we do. And so um, let's dig into what classification is a bit. So uh, the analogy I want to use for classification is shelving. I thought that might be relevant to uh, librarians. Um, in essence, when we receive a publication, uh, we are asked to shelve it in one of three shelves. So uh, there's a top shelf, um, and that's a, objectionable material. We classify some as objectionable, and that basically means it's illegal. Uh, there is restricted, which means uh, it's illegal for some. And uh, the actual definition of restricted is that it's objectionable, except if one or more of the following circumstances apply. Um, and that is that the availability is restricted to people who have attained an age not exceeding 18 years or it's restricted to specific classes of people. So it's objectionable, but you can manage that by putting in place some restrictions. And then uh, the last, the, the last uh, lowest shelf is unrestricted. And uh, this is what I describe as the default shelf. Uh, because if uh, we can't find reasons to restrict it, then this is where um, Section 14 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act uh, and the freedom of expression guaranteed in that really comes into play. We will default to unrestricted if we can't find reasons to restrict uh, publications. Um, like any uh, shelving process, we have to apply rules when we shelve. Um, and uh, these are the rules that we apply. They're all sitting in the law. Um, I do issue some caution. There's lots of text ahead. You don't need to read lots of text. There's law. Law comes this way. 
Uh, so this is basically the definition of objectionable that we use. Um, and there is one particular element of it that is really important for us. It is uh, this here. This is called the subject matter gateway. Um, and the uh, that phrase, subject matter gateway, um, was put in place by the Court of Appeal. And in essence, what that means is that if a publication doesn't deal with matters such as sex, horror, crime, cruelty, or violence, then it doesn't come into our um, purview of being able to make objectionable. Um, now, the effect of that is that some of the things um, that Louise mentioned before that, that are potentially harmful are not capable of being made objectionable. Um, we include in that hate speech. Hate speech without these elements in it, uh, we cannot classify as objectionable. Mis and disinformation, um, we cannot classify as objectionable. And so some of the fears around censorship relate to the suppression of ideas. And in our law, we don't have scope to be able to do that without sex, horror, crime, cruelty, or violence. Um, and that's a really important um, protection um, and the extent of the act. So we spend most of our time thinking about the latter part of it, though. Um, and this is the test that we, we apply, is um, that the availability of the publication is likely to be injurious to the public good. And so that's where we spend most of our time. Um, and uh, what does it mean for a publication to be injurious to the public good? Well, there's a whole lot of those that Parliament has deemed to be injurious to the public good. Um, and that is this category of them. Um, so Parliament's told us that these, these are deemed to be objectionable. Um, the test for these is that they promote or support or tend to promote or support these particular, um, uh, this particular content. Now, courts have told us that it is a very high bar for publications to be included uh, in, in this deeming criteria. So we apply that promote and support very strictly. Um, if you look down that list of content, um, all but one of them uh, is illegal. Um, mm -hmm. I won't uh, belabor that, but it's this one here, which is not illegal. Um, but all of the rest of them uh, is illegal content. And two of them represent our most used categories. Um, and very unfortunately, the two of them are uh, the exploitation of children or young persons or both for sexual purposes. Um, that is by far and away the largest category of publications that we make illegal. Um, and the other one that features quite regularly is acts of torture or the infliction of extreme violence or extreme cruelty. And that violence can be uh, both terrorist or criminal violence. Um, and uh, some of those publications are very extreme. So this is a, this is a very high standard and a very high test. Um, the uh, publications that fall beneath this uh, require a determination from us. Um, and my deepest apologies about this slide, do, do not try and read it, um, is uh, these. So this guides us in what we have to consider um, when we're determining whether publications are objectionable. You can see it covers a whole gambit of, um, of things that might be depicted uh, in publications. And you'll also see that there's some crossover. Um, and uh, again, unfortunately, the uh, most um, frequently visited uh, areas of this are uh, sexual conduct with or by children, um, the exploitation of the nudity of children, young people, or both, 
and also promotion or encouragement of criminal acts or acts of terrorism. Those are those are often um, the uh, the type of publications that we're receiving. And our real focus here is the extent and degree to which and the manner in which the publication deals with these things. So it's not that they're contained within there. In fact, you'll find uh, many uh, films and books deal with uh, criminal acts and terrorism. It's, it's something that people find um, entertaining and they make for good stories. The difference is, do they promote or encourage them and to the extent and degree and manner in which they do that? Um, so there's a lot that we have to take into account there if it exists within the publication. Um, but that's not the end of it. And the next slide is equally daunting. And so these are the things that we have to consider. These are mandatory relevant considerations that we have to take into account when we're classifying a publication. And if you've read any of our decisions, you'll see us go through these and address them as they come up. Um, and, uh, you know, the first one is, is a very important one. What's the dominant effect of the publication as a whole? Um, but we work through them all. Uh, and we end up uh, classifying um, and putting them in our shelves. There are some additional rules that are not contained within that. All of that is contained within one section of the Act. It's within Section 3 of the Act. Um, there's some additional rules. We can put in place age restrictions for publications that are not um, uh, that are not objectionable, and that's if there's highly offensive language, uh, if they depict bodily harm, um, suicide, dangerous, imitable behaviour, degrading images to a to degree that they may disturb or shock or cause harm to others. Um, so. There, there is a bit of flex outside of that, but that's not to make publications objectionable. It's to age restrict publications. Um, so that's the process that we go through when we classify every publication. Um, and the difference between a publication that is a piece of entertainment and the publication that is um, a bit of uh, child sexual abuse material that's taken during a police investigation is how much we write up. Um, so, so that's the basic difference. They go through the same legal test. Uh, so how do we deal with publications that you might find most often at libraries? So one of the things you, you've got increasingly in libraries now are DVDs. Now, technically, uh, DVDs are films for the purposes of our legislation, and films must be labelled before they can be shown to the public, either in cinemas or distributed on home entertainment, and included in that is some of the larger uh, streaming services such as Netflix, um, Disney, Neon is included in that list. Uh, for the physical media, like, like films and cinemas and DVDs, they have a pathway to classification, uh, and that's via a body called the Film and Video Labelling Body. Um, and they are the people who produce um, these uh, lovely stickers, um, and they literally are stickers. If you go to their office, they have a whole room full of little stickers. Um, with these pictures on them. Um, so they can label publications themselves, which have these top stickers. These are unrestricted. These are just guidance stickers. Um, and they can apply these ones themselves if they don't think there's restrictable material in it, or they're copying um, a uh, publication, they're copying a um, rating from Australia or the United Kingdom. So those ones, we we may not have seen those publications when they go out. Um, the restricted label, these ones, and so this, these ones say 18, but other ages can apply, 16, 13. Um, these uh, are restrictions. These are legal restrictions. 
This means a person uh, under the age of 18 cannot attend, and this means they cannot attend unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. Um, the red label over here is one that is applied by certain streaming services. You'll notice it's missing the restricted. There's no legal restriction of those publications. Um, we all, the uh, labelling body also attaches to the uh, stickers warnings. Uh, so the warnings are there to help, they're to give uh, alert to the content that's in there. So Percy Jackson is a uh, streaming service warning. Certain streaming services, those big ones, are authorised to do their own labels and warnings, um, but they've got a limited selection of warnings. So you get violence, scary scenes. Um, we like to add a bit more colour, if you like, to our um, warnings. In essence, we want to really warn people of the stuff that's in there. We don't want people being surprised. Um, and so we include, uh, that is from Poor Things. If you've seen Poor Things, I think that's a pretty accurate um, description of what you're going to get. Um, and no one's going to be surprised going into that. Um, the, the next type of publications, and I guess this is in the title of the uh, toolkit that we're talking about, is um, books. It's the Freedom to Read Toolkit. Uh, books are different from films. Books don't need labels. And I suppose to that end, the publishing, publishing industry isn't regulated by our Act, but books can be classified. Um, they, they come in to our, our workflow, if you like, through this forensic work channel. Um, and uh, it literally is in the same section. You see it here. Uh, it's a submission of publication by others. So there is a right for a New Zealand Custom Service, the Commissioner of Police. This is the Secretary of Internal Affairs to submit publications to us um, and any other person. Uh, but other people um, is, uh, they are required to grant, get leave from the Chief Censor to have that classified. Um, the chief censor, in terms of considering leave, uh, will want to know, you know, what's the potential harm from the publication? What's the reason someone wants it classified? Um, we might make some inquiries around that. I did speak to Louise um, prior to recommending that the chief censor uh, grant leave for the Welcome to Sex book. Um, it, it just helped us understand the context in uh, which that, that request was being made. Uh, forms are available on the website, and there is a fee for this for um, leave applications. It's only payable if the leave has been granted. And for a person without a commercial interest in a publication, it's only about $25. Um, in terms of outcome, where well, you get a written classification decision, um, and potentially you get a, a direction to issue a label. Uh, now, I've repeated this slide because you actually can't get these labels for books. I think there might have been some issued in the past, but, but there actually isn't provision in the Act to get those labels um, issued for books. So really, it's only restricted labels that are going to be given for books if that's necessary. Uh, books have been banned. Um, and in general terms, uh, they're banned uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, I've got a couple of examples of banned books here. Um, these are older, they're, they're quite consistent with the ones that, that we're doing at the moment. Um, one is the promotion of crime. So this one is uh, how to make methamphetamine, basically. In recent uh, months, we've looked at some of these types of books that were previously banned about marijuana. And given the changes in the law around marijuana, we've reclassified some of those with restrictions, um, usually around age, uh, because actually it's potentially a legitimate um, exercise to grow marijuana subject to certain um, conditions. Uh, the other one um, just popped out of the uh, list of the books. It's a librarian enslaved. Um, and I don't know. 
this is this is not the type of enslavement that might relate to remuneration for librarians. So this one uh, was banned in 1996, contained sexual violence, bestiality and torture. And actually, that's a reason why uh, publications may still be banned um, because of the um, sexually violent content uh, and that sort of um, publication. Uh, many of the banned books that we receive, we receive in different formats. Now, these were both paperback books, but we tend to get things off the internet. Uh, well, there are restrictions that we can put on books as well. So this one I thought was quite interesting because this book was previously banned in 1968. Um, and the Auckland uh, Central Library resub submitted it for reconsideration on 13 November 2020 and didn't feel that it uh, merited censorship any longer. I suppose we, we partially agreed with that um, and, and we still did a bit of censoring by putting an age restriction on it. Um, and the explanation is uh, contained there. Basically, uh, we just thought that they reflected, adults would be able to understand the the uh, misogynistic and uh, sometimes sexually violent uh, songs that were contained within that. Um, but uh, we felt that that should be restricted to those who are old enough to understand that. And I suppose by, by way of conclusion, my uh, my best advice to you is to use our website. Um, we we have uh, lots of written advice on there, um, but also we've got lots of ways you can contact the office. And there are friendly folk in the office who are more than happy to talk to you and answer questions or concerns that you might have or to receive the uh, correspondence from the people who uh, who have concerns about the publications. We receive that um, in relation more often to uh, films, but also in relation to books. So, so that's our role. That's why we're here. Um, feel free to use us as you need. Thank you. Good, Rupert. That was that was a lovely um, quick guide to the most relevant parts of what you're dealing with. So, um, I. I also think that the the website is very useful. Uh, it's got a lot of because of their education focus. There's a lot of really useful information there, and I recommend um, that you do do have a look at it. So um, now um, we are going to hear from Nicole Brown, who is from the Office of Human Rights Proceedings. Over to you, Nicole. Kia ora. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rupert. I found that really interesting. Um, so by way of brief introduction, uh, my name is Nicole. I'm a senior solicitor at the Office of Human Rights Proceedings. We are an independent Crown entity also, um, and we are part of, uh, well, we're related to the Human Rights Commission, but we are separate and independent from the Human Rights Commission. So the role of my office is to receive applications from uh, people for breaches of the Human Rights Act, where they haven't been able to resolve those complaints through the Human Rights Commission process, um, and they're interested in taking a case further to the Human Rights Review Tribunal. So if we do grant representation, we continue uh, with that case through to the Human Rights Review Tribunal and potentially to the higher courts as well. Um, so I'm going to try and fly through these slides a little bit um, just to see uh, to cover off kind of the framework that applies in terms of human rights in New Zealand um, and in particular the considerations I think are relevant for libraries um, and with a focus uh, on hate speech and how that interacts with the um, uh, right to freedom of expression um, and then at the end I've got a little bit of um, practical guidance for libraries um, so this slide, you'll see um, our two main pieces of legislation, the first one being the Human Rights Act, which is mainly the space that I operate in. Um, and so we also call that an anti-discrimination act. I'll, I'll come to explaining the operation of that act in particular a little bit more. Um, but the other big piece of legislation is the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. So that's where we see the freedom of expression uh, captured and essentially the the way that that act operates is as a vehicle for holding the state accountable. 
Um, and so the Human Rights Act governs both the relationship between individual citizens and the state um, and the, the relationship between individual citizens and private bodies. And so the example that I give there all the time is um, a person who uses a wheelchair, uh, wants to go to a cafe and there is no ramp or they won't allow their guide dog inside um, if, if it's a person who needs a guide dog. So that Human Rights Act is focused really on preventing discrimination. Um, but those two pieces of legislation really are sourced more broadly from our international commitments. Um, so I've included a few examples there. Um, and in particular, you'll see uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That's where our right to freedom of expression comes from originally. So that's our um, that's Article 19 of that uh, covenant. And we'll see how that's related into New Zealand domestic legislation in, in a wee bit. But the important thing to note there is that while it's a very broad right to freedom of expression, there is um, a particular carve out which acknowledges the special duties of people exercising their freedom of expression um, and that that might be limited by uh, law. Um, and Rupert's already touched a little bit on how class classification might uh, impede slightly on that freedom of expression only within very strict um, circumstances. Uh, and that's really based in that Article 19, which says that it must be for the protection of the rights or reputation of individuals or for um, moral reasons, the public good, public health. Uh, another particularly relevant international uh, document is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racism. And that's our basis for our hate speech provision in the Human Rights Act. So in that particular convention, all state parties who have agreed to it um, accept that they will uh, condemn any uh, language or um, material that encourages discrimination or um, promotes one race above others. So that's really where that came from. Um, and when we're bringing cases under the Human Rights Act, um, we really try to bring in these broader principles and the origins and intentions of our international obligations to view those through the most rights enhancing lens we can. And so I've just mentioned, um, just out of interest for anybody, um, non-binding non -binding material, so that includes human rights guidelines. The Yogi Carter principles are really interesting. Um, they were a group of principles that were reached by a number of independent human rights experts who met in Yogi Carter in Indonesia to focus on the rights of rainbow people um, and to talk about the specific ways in which um, people from the rainbow community are affected by discrimination, by hate speech in particular, um, limited access to particular areas. Uh, when, when you're thinking about, you know, um, about issues that affect the rainbow community, I really encourage you to have a look at those principles. Um, they're also just really interesting reading. So I think we can go to the next slide. So this, um, this slide addresses the Human Rights Act framework. So this is focused very much on the Human Rights Act. As I mentioned, it's really an anti-discrimination act. Um, and that means that in certain areas of life, uh, people can't be treated um, more negatively because of one of these prohibited grounds. Um, and you'll see that they're all set out there. One of the particularly interesting things is that we currently have a prohibited ground of discrimination for sex. Um, there have been calls to expand that to clarify that that includes gender. Um, our office's position is that by applying an ambulatory reading of um, sex that should include gender, um, but it's certainly something that's still being up for debate. The Human Rights Act also includes um, prohibitions on sexual harassment and racial harassment. Um, and then you'll see I've highlighted racial disharmony, which is our hate speech provision. Um, what people aren't often very aware of in terms of hate speech is that in our Human Rights Act, um, that's limited to um, speech relating to someone's a group 
um, based on their colour, race, ethnic or national origin. It, it's not broader than that. There have been calls recently to expand it to include religion um, because, of course, the 15 March um, mosque attacks. Um, and there is currently a case before the Court of Appeal, which is due to be heard in April, um, that re essentially says that the, the government's failure to include sexual orientation within um, within that protection is a legislative omission um, that discriminates against the plaintiff. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that develops over time and whether that develops in the current government. Um, it, it has been um, it has been back and forth. There was just one one further point on that last slide that I'll just quickly cover off, um, and that is victimization. So that addresses instances where someone is treated worse because of either because they've brought a complaint under the Human Rights Act or they intend to or they intend to support somebody else to bring it. So victimization is really all about somebody responding and trying to shut someone up. Um, so it's actually a really important mechanism of the Human Rights Act and it's something that we see triggered quite a lot. Um, so the next slide. Um, there are kind of there are two different key parts to the Human Rights Act, Part 1A and Part 2. As I mentioned before, Part 2, well, as I mentioned before, um, the Human Rights Act relates both to holding the state accountable and also regulating interactions between private actors. So Part 2 is really focused on those private actors. And when you're bringing a claim under um, one of the you know, anti-discrimination provisions, sexual harassment, racial harassment, it needs to relate to one of those areas of life. When a claim is brought against a public entity or an entity that's carrying out a public function like a library, that claim is usually brought under part 1A. And so there it doesn't need to be specific to one of these areas of life. There just needs to be evidence of discrimination. Um, and there needs to be proof that that discrimination cannot be justified in a free and democratic society. Uh, so that, that can be a claim brought against an individual who's conducted themselves a certain way, particularly, uh, you know, sexual harassment. Um, but it also can be brought against the employer of that individual or anyone uh, for whom that individual is acting as an agent. Um, and so that that's a vicarious liability provision. It, the assumption is that as an employer, if your employee does something that breaches the Human Rights Act, you will be vicariously liable unless you can show that you took all reasonably practicable steps to prevent that breach. Um, so the answer to that always is have a policy and train your staff, um, check in with staff. Uh, in particular, we see this a lot with sexual harassment, especially in employment, um, but it can also happen where there might be a visitor to a library who approaches um, a staff member treats them, you know, sexually harasses them, treats them negatively. There are obligations to undertake a good investigation there as well. So that's kind of an overview of the Human Rights Act. Um, the next part. Sorry, Angela, I'll just get you to skip slides. Yeah, so now I really want to focus. Sorry, I whipped through that a little bit because it's quite dense, um, not super fun. But um, the most interesting part, I think, of this seminar for us, um, well, my session, is this question of balancing hate speech versus freedom of expression. Um, and what we'll see is as we work through the legislation and the relevant case, the key case, um, is that neither of those provisions or the rights that they intend to protect um, are limitless. So there are certain rights that we call non-derogable, um, and those are things like the right to life, the right to be free from torture, um, the right to not be imprisoned um, in accordance with the law that came out after you had um, breached it. Um, but hate, the, the right to be free from hate speech and freedom of expression, both of those have built-in limits. Um, and that's kind of what I mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of the certain restrictions that apply to freedom of expression. So I have to apologise for the next couple of slides, which are also um, snips from uh, legislation, <laughs> but I will I will hold you here for a second. Um, so this is the key provision in terms of um, 
hate speech. Um, there's civil and there's criminal hate speech. But what I really want to draw your attention to in this section is uh, 611A, and you'll see that it's unlawful to distribute written matter. So that would include a library holding a certain piece of work that is threatening, abusive, or insulting. So that's the first part of that test. And then if you look down the bottom just below C, um, being matter or words likely to excite hostility or bring into contempt any group of persons who may be coming to New Zealand, um, who may, may be in or coming to New Zealand on the ground of colour, race, ethnic or national origins. So that's a two part test. Firstly, what has to be included in that written matter must be threatening, abusive or insulting. Um, in terms of something being insulting, compared to the second part of the test, that's actually quite a low threshold. People say insulting things about different ethnic groups all the time. What is the really tricky part is that second part being matter or words likely to excite hostility against or bring into contempt. Um, and so as we'll see, we'll, we'll get to a case. Um, it's very difficult to demonstrate that there has been uh, that there is likely to be a particular effect on a group of persons. So if we just jump to the next one. This is the criminal equivalent. And so the only difference here, apart from um, some minor, what we'll say, drafting errors have been acknowledged by, um, by government, you'll see down the bottom where we've got site hostility. We also have ill will and ridicule. So those are kind of some other avenues that you can get in with. Um, there's no good reason for that being excluded from the previous provision. But the, the real difference in this provision is that you must be doing it with intent. So um, the general difference between a civil liability and a criminal liability being that you have an intent to do something and here you must have the intent to excite hostility or ill will. So the, that's, um, that's hate speech. The next couple of slides we have are about freedom of expression. So this is from the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and we've got the freedom of expression provision there, which you'll see is very broad. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that, that right itself is inherently limited. And so that's actually accounted for through the Bill of Rights Act in its entirety. So sections four and six, um, and I haven't included it here, but five as well, all relate to how these broad rights operate within our society where we might need to limit them. And so you'll see from section four there, if there is an inconsistency between one of these broad rights and a piece of legislation, for example, section 61 of the Human Rights Act, then that other piece of legislation will win out. But the idea is that you very rarely get to that point. Um, the intention is that if possible, an interpretation that's consistent with that right will be read in. Um, and so what that means is you'll read that section 61 provision as having an extremely high threshold. Um, that means that it's not unnecessarily limiting that right to freedom of expression. So there is a bit of a process the courts go through when they're assessing whether something is inconsistent with the freedom of expression um, right or any of the rights under the Bill of Rights Act. And so I can see that I'm running out of time, but we'll go quickly to a case. Um, and that is the Wall and Fairfax case. So this was heard by the High Court in 2018, and it involved a cartoon that was depicted, I believe, in the Marlborough Times. Um, and it was a cartoon of um, Māori and Pacific appearance, um, and it was in relation to whether they're good, they're good parents, essentially. It depicted them as being lazy and more interested in spending money on cigarettes and alcohol than on their children. And so the court found pretty easily that that matter was insulting, but what it struggled to find was that there was evidence that that would be likely to excite hostility or contempt um, against Māori or Pacifica people as a group. And in particular, 
they they focused on there's a really good Canadian case that analyzes this and they had a quote there which was that hate speech legislation is not aimed at discouraging repugnant or offensive ideas it does not for example prohibit expression which debates the merits of reducing rights of vulnerable groups of society it only restricts the use of the expression exposing them to hatred as part of that debate it does not target the ideas but their mode of expression in public and the effect of that mode of expression might have so essentially it's all about what that's going to do to a normal member of the public if somebody already has these really terrible views about a group then there's no evidence of that change of mind so the threshold is extremely high and as that fits with the freedom of expression right the court determined that because that threshold is so very high there is no inconsistency with the right to freedom of expression um, so what that means for libraries um, if we jump onto the next slide is that it's very unlikely that anything that libraries hold will meet that very very high threshold um, however the threshold might be slightly lower when we're thinking about the public function um, of a library in that case it was a private actor and so the expectations were slightly lower um, if if a library thinks that they might be holding content or being asked to hold content that could breach the hate speech provision and that it might excite hostility against a particular group um, the best thing to do is undertake a very rigorous um, assessment of that I've indicated that that might include getting legal advice because it is very difficult um, to meet that very high threshold and if you decline to hold certain material the author or a reader requesting it might have grounds um, to bring a claim that they've been discriminated against on the basis of their political opinion um, if you know, we see a lot of the time people who want certain works to be published um, and have them declined think that that's because they're a white straight man often um, so we, we do see that come up and so the best thing to do is just undertake a very detailed and rigorous process that records all of the reasons for excluding a, a particular piece of work um, ultimately like i say the risk of actually coming afoul of that provision is low um, but it might be that the intention is to really safeguard against that um, yeah so so that's kind of the advice i have in terms of those two more generally um, on our next slide i've just got a couple of last thoughts um, reasonable accommodation and access i mentioned this at the outset um, the person with a wheelchair who wants to you know come to a library and there's no ramp or wants to um, read a particular book but doesn't have access to where that is held um, es essentially we do have an obligation to provide reasonable accommodation to people with disabilities um, that can't be um, an undue burden on a library so if the request is um, extremely disproportionate with the need then it might not be appropriate once again the best thing to do is to do an investigation of what is required what you can do and record that um, and I've mentioned this before I will hammer at home always have policies um, and have training for your staff um, especially when it comes to harassment um, we see oftentimes that employers or um, organizations want to prevent harassment from happening but don't do anything until after it occurs the obligation exists before it occurs um, and then my last thought is just we love to see more um, use of te reo Māori in all public spaces being conscious of the fact that te reo Māori is tonga um, and that it should be used in the right spirit um, and making sure that you know what it means um, and whether it's appropriate for a particular space so apologies conscious that I, I took up quite a lot of time um, but it is a very interesting landscape um, hopefully the slides will be shared after this so that if you want to do a little bit more looking into things um, you you can uh, the other thing i will say is that the human rights commission has some really great resources in terms of policies for the workplace worksafe has some great ones as well thank you
Carol and Nicole. Um, I, I, I love you hammering home um, policies and processes and being prepared because that's exactly why we created the toolkit. Um, I, 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 we, we are running close to time. Um, I'm going to quickly hand over <laughs> to Marlies, who will, who will race through her section. Thanks, yeah. Marlies. Kia ora, Louise, and um, kia ora, Rupert and Nicole. Yeah, I would just really quickly say this so there's an opportunity for questions, but basically we just wanted to highlight that there's a, a link between how these democratic principles sort of fall from these large international conventions, the UN, um, into our industry, such as IFLA, um, and then all the way down to Lianza, which sort of replicate these statements in the various um, policies and statements that they put out and they endorse these principles. And these are also really valuable to link into your collection policies. So I just found online the Dunedin Public Libraries, for example, um, Section 12, Intellectual Freedom of their Collection Management Policy. They say that they endorse the Leander Statement of Freedom of Information. So that's how we can really see that link falling through into our industry. Um, but yeah, I'll wrap it up there um, and hand over to Louise and give our listeners a chance to ask some questions. Got it, Marlies. <laughs> Fantastic. Very good. And uh, yes, um, a very quick time now for questions, which, as I said, um, if you could put them through the chat, um, you can direct them to um, uh, any of us, um, Nicole and Rupert, while you have the chance, perhaps. So um, we'll just wait for any questions to come up. I'm not seeing any there. So just while um, we wait, just um, all all these resources are available for you online, the Lianza Toolkit, of course, but also um, the, the other institutions have great websites which have those resources as well. Um, so it, it is quite easy if you want to do more of a deep dive into any of these areas um, to find out more um, with your own research. Uh, I hesitate to say your own research, <laughs> given what that has come to mean. Look, I, I th uh, yes, I think um, I think people are conscious of the time and, and quite probably have um, uh, things that they need to be heading off to. So um, in which case, um, a huge thank you again to our guest speakers um, and uh, to all the people who are involved in the toolkit. Uh, we have had a question about whether the recordings are going to be available. Yes. Uh, again, I understand through um, Leanza Connect. Is that right, Angela? Uh, they'll go out in the next newsletter, Korero, which yeah. will go out um, within the next few days probably later in the week, if not Tuesday, since we've got Easter coming up this week. Um, and they're also available on our YouTube um, channel. So we suggest subscribing to them because this um, webinar will be on there. The previous one is on there. And the next one, which is on disinformation, will also be recorded and available. You are Angela. Okay, as as we just hit two o'clock then, um, I'm going to close our session with a karakia. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia mai te uru tapu nui. Kia watia, kia mama, te nāko te tinana, e hingin hiningano, e te āra takatū. Koea rā e rongu. E fakaria ake kironga, kia tina, homie, huie, tai, kie.